In this video, I'll discuss research on penetration testing of a small unmanned aerial system. This video is brought to you by the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Center. The creation of this video was funded by a National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Grant. My name is Philip Kreger, and I'm an Associate Professor of Cybersecurity at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. So this is the third in a multi-part series of videos dealing with small unmanned aerial systems, or as I'm going to call them, drones. So the first video provided an overview of what drones are and what their purposes are. For example, we discussed how they are used in commerce and government. We described a drone's components. And we looked at the theoretical threats to drones. And in the second video, we discussed identifying drone vulnerabilities, in particular for an AR Drone 2, which is made by Parrot, a French company. And we identified several multiple vulnerabilities. And these included multiple open network ports on the drone, the fact that the drone lacked any sort of encryption mechanism, and the lack of authentication mechanisms. Now for the final series of videos, we're going to conduct a penetration test of the AR Drone 2, and we're going to use common penetration testing techniques and tools to exploit the vulnerabilities that we identified in the previous step that we talked about in the second video. Now I hope you realize there's nothing magical here. We're using the same mindset and the same tools that are used by white hat hackers and what we call malign actors, that is, hackers, to exploit a computing system. Because as we discussed in the first video, essentially looking at the components of a drone, that a drone is simply a flying and hovering computer. So about the final series of videos. So if you've watched the first video and the second video, you saw that the videos increased in the order of prior knowledge required to understand the presentation. Pretty much anybody can understand everything that was discussed in the first video. In the second video, we started presenting networking concepts, which hopefully you as a student in computer science or information technology would understand most of what I discussed. Now this video again requires a little more specialized knowledge of computing and networking. However, in this video we've attempted to provide a presentation that explains the concept sufficiently for someone who has a fundamental understanding of networking concepts and a few simple Linux commands. And if you don't understand this video, once you do take a class or you start teaching yourself about networking and start using Linux, you will understand the concepts that are discussed in this video. Now let's look back at what we found in the second video so everything in this video makes sense. We ran a network scan on the AR drone and we found out that it had several open ports. And as you see there on the left, those ports that are listed with their port number 21 all the way through 5559 are all open ports. That means that the drone is listening for networking traffic to come across those ports. And what did those ports do? What are they listening for? Well, we saw that three of them were for transferring data and for remote access by an administrator, as you see there on the left. And if you need to, anytime during this video, if there's something you don't understand or you want to read more, go ahead and hit the pause button. We saw that two of those ports were for video feeds, which we would expect of a drone that had a camera. And finally, of course, uh, we need a couple of ports for navigation and control data. Furthermore, we did a vulnerability assessment using a commercial tool, and we found that the drone had several critical as well as a high and a medium vulnerability. Now what we're going to do with this is that we're going to take advantage of these vulnerabilities to access the drone. And also recalled that we used something called a proxy for this research. And all a proxy does, and as you see here in the middle, this is a Raspberry Pi, a $35 small computing device that allows us to connect to the drone 
from our attacker here on the left, which is my MacBook Pro. And the reason we use this proxy is because now we can hide the IP address of the attacker. You see up here in the right hand corner, we have our drone. You see the associated IP addresses here. This is a dot one for the AR drone. You see down here that the controller is actually a smartphone with an app. And then the app is used to control the drone. And you also see the IP address of the controller here, a dot two. And you see in the middle here is that we have our Raspberry Pi that is then going to be able to connect to the drone over this protocol that is called Telnet. And finally, you see over here to the left is that we have our attacker, which is going to connect to the drone. Notice that these are on the same network right here. We have a .86.32 for the attacker and a .86.25 for the Raspberry Pi. But also we have a secondary external network adapter, which then allows us to, to connect on the same network, the .1.5 here, to the drone thus hiding the fact that this MacBook Pro is actually the attacker that is issuing the commands that we're running from the Raspberry Pi. The first step is to connect to the Raspberry Pi from the MacBook Pro. And so we're connecting over this protocol called SSH, which is called Secure Shell. And essentially that's an encrypted protocol. And notice that the proxy is running a version of Linux. So we will have to use terminal commands like the old DOS systems. That is, there is no GUI on the proxy. And so here we have Little Buddy, which is the name of the MacBook Pro. And we're connecting to the Kali, which is a version of Linux that is running on the Raspberry Pi. So here we're noticing that we're using SSH to connect to the root account on the Raspberry Pi. And if you notice here in the left hand corner, we're now connecting to it. And if you also notice up here that this required a password to connect, SSH will always require a password. And again, SSH is an encrypted protocol. Notice now, if we see that the prompt over here is saying Kali, which means that I am sitting on the Raspberry Pi, which is running Linux. And so the first thing we want to do is we identified that Telnet, which had been identified as a vulnerability from our vulnerability assessment, was running on the AR drone. So we're going to try to use that Telnet backdoor to connect to the AR drone. And so here on the Raspberry Pi, I'm issuing, issuing the Telnet command. And here's the IP address of the drone. And we look down here and I'm connected to the drone. Now, once I'm on the drone, I run the ls command, which is the Linux command that says list the current directory. And then you see all these blue highlighted words down here, which are essentially directories that are sitting on the drone. If you look up above that, this says that once we connected the drone, that this BusyBox built-in shell ash is displayed. This means that the drone is actually running a version of Linux. Now, I want you to stop the video for maybe 10 seconds and just look at everything that transpired in here. Is there something that's missing? Okay, if you're back with us, let's go to the next screen. What did you notice that might be of concern? There's really two big issues. The first is that nowhere in there when I'm connecting to the drone did it ask for a user ID or a password. Second, notice this prompt down here. For those of you who don't understand Linux, and for those of you who do, what does this mean? This hash means that I'm running as root. And root, for those of you who don't know, is just similar to an account, let's say for Windows, as the administrator account. What can the administrator do on a Windows computer? Well, the administrator can do anything they want. They can install programs, they can remove programs, they can go in and they can change systems files. They can pretty much do anything. Essentially what we're doing is we're running as the God account now on the drone. So again, I'm connected to the I'm connected to the Raspberry Pi here, and then I'm connected to the drone. So now I'm sitting on the drone. So what's the first thing we're going to do if this is the first time that we've connected to this drone? Well, in, in old, in old criminal justice parlance, 
I know a lot of you are probably going to be very young, so you probably don't know what casing the joint means. Casing the joint means that as a burglar, that you're going to look around to see what you can find. So let's do that. So the first thing I do is, is I change to one of the directories, which is the same thing as a folder in Windows, and this is called the bin directory for binary, and this is where the directories where executable commands exist. This PWD up here just means print current working directory. And so I'm looking in here, and I've taught Linux for 15, 20 years, and I noticed that there are some commands in here that are very interesting, and those are denoted with the red arrows. So they have the DD, the MV, the PS, the kill, RM, RMDIR, SH, and VI. Why are those interesting commands? Well, some of those that I just pointed out are what we would call destructive commands. So the RM command is to remove a file or directory. The RMDIR is to remove a directory, and by removing, that's saying delete. Kill means to kill a process. That is, as you have a process that's running, you can stop that process from running. And finally, I'm just going to point out one more. You have the DD command, which is a command that's actually used a lot in forensics, and that's to read and write bits. And that can be used for a lot of things, including overwriting a file, which is even worse than deleting a file. Other destructive commands we found, look over here on the left, what are all of these doing? Power off, halt, reboot, RM mod. Well, the first three, essentially, <laughs> turn off your computer. And so, if any of you who've played around with Linux, if you've ever sh used the power off, halt, or reboot commands, you know that that essentially turns off your computer. Well, well if a bad actor, if a hacker had connected to the drone and issued one of these commands while the drone was flying, what would happen? Well, you can guess, but let's move on. Okay, I've moved to another directory. Here's the, uh, the firmware directory, and I do a list directory, and we see that it has some interesting files in here. GPS firmware dot bin. So these are files that are associated with the GPS that is residing on the drone. Now let's think like a hacker. Can I replace that version of the GPS firmware with a version that shows an inaccurate geolocation information? Or what if I deleted that file? Let's move on. Okay, suffice to say, I did much more casing of the joint than what we just saw here, but this is giving you a taste of how a hacker would go about finding out what is on the drone and how they could take advantage of what they find. So. Let's just say we're finished casing the drone. Let's perform some attacks. Okay, one of the things I want to know is, can we exfiltrate files? That is exfiltrate, that means steal files from the drone. As you recall, if you viewed this, the second video, is that we found that one of the open ports on the drone was something called FTP, which is File Transfer Protocol. So that's used to copy files to and from the devices. Is it possible for the hacker, which is us, to steal files or to even upload files to the drone? Well, we see up here, now I'm sitting, notice it says Kali right here, and I'm issuing the FTP command to the drone. Notice that, that no username or password is required because notice this says 230 operation successful so without using a username and password that is no authentication now now sitting on the drone I run an LS in here to list the files and now I see there's one file called user box and this long number after that so I'm going to issue an, an FTP command to get this and try to download it so I've requested the file download Operation successful, the file is downloaded, and I, can, I issue the command buy, and then I'm gone for the drone, so essentially I've downloaded this file. Okay, can we upload files to the drone? You, you probably know the answer to this, but let's take a look. So again, I'm connecting up here on the upper left-hand corner, FTP to the IP address of the drone. I'm logged into the drone with no username or password required. And now I'm going to issue this man, command called put 
which is the opposite of get. Get means to download, put means to upload. So I'm going to upload this file called malware.exe and it really wasn't malware. And by the way, as we discussed in earlier videos, is that this was a borrowed drone, so I had to make sure that I didn't do anything particularly nasty to it. So I'm requesting to upload the malware.exe. Operation successful. I run that ls command over here, which is just to list the files. And now malware.exe is sitting on the drone. So not only have we downloaded files from the drone, we've uploaded to those. And the reason we could do that is because no authentication was required to do so. Let's look at another attack. We're going to eliminate the control feed between the controller and the drone. So in order to do this, we're going to use free software for something called a de-authentication attack. Okay, what does that mean? Well, let's think about that. Is that obviously to control the drone, you have to have some sort of controller and it can be a, a, an actual physical controller that you've probably seen somewhere on the internet. And for a lot of the smaller and, and less expensive drones, it's going to be a smartphone that has an app on it. And so to, to control the drone, you need the app to be able to connect to the drone. And so what deauthentication does is it's going to remove that connection between the controller and the drone, which means that no longer is there a connection between the two. And so what happens? Well, some of that was discussed in the second video, and so if you want to take a look at that, I would suggest that you do so. So let's see how that we use this deauthentication de attack. And what I'm going to use is a, an open source free software called aircrack-ng. Now, before I discuss this, I want you to know that the, that this can be illegal. If you're doing this to somebody else, you're doing something is illegal. But I'm doing this to my own drone and therefore it's okay. So just remember that a lot of these things I'm showing you is just for demonstration purposes and be very careful with the use of this because as again, it is illegal. This is the command up here and I'm not gonna go too much into this because if I went into a full-fledged description of everything I did, this would be a five hour video. And I want it to be short so I, I can keep your interest at least for uh, 25 or 30 minutes. So. What are we showing here? These are the, this, the command that I'm running from Aircrack, and this is a part of the Aircrack suite called Air Replay ng These are MAC addresses, and if you think about a MAC address, a MAC address is going to be a unique identifier for the network card. And so this identifier right here is the MAC address of the drone. I'm showing here the 9003B7 right here at the very top. And on the right hand side is the MAC address of the smartphone. Okay, and if you think about this, this is actually kind of cheating because I know the MAC address is my smartphone, but what if I didn't know it? What if I was this external threat actor that is the hacker? How do I find out these MAC addresses? Well, the way to do that is to put that network card that I showed you previously in something called monitor mode. So monitor mode is different than the normal mode of connecting over a network card, connecting over a network. So in, instead of being an active part of a conversation between two computing devices, in this case, the smartphone and the drone, I'm going to do so passively so I can essentially listen and hopefully you all know what eavesdropping means. It means that you're listening in on two, at least, you know, two or more people discussing something without being an active participant. And that means I'm not actually connected to Wi-Fi. All I'm doing is I'm listening to the packets that are going throughout the air. And because I'm not an active participant, no one will know that I'm listening. So going back to here, so essentially this is what we were looking for previously when we were connecting to the drone via Telnet and via FTP. But if somebody were on the drone or you looked at the log files of the drone, they would be able to look back and see that there was a connection between this proxy and this drone. Well, we don't want that in this case. Monitor mode means that now that this external network adapter is listening to all the packets and the nearby vicinity without being an active part of a connection. Again, this is illegal unless you're doing it to yourself. So please don't do that. 
So to make a long story short, these are the commands I had to run on the Raspberry Pi in order to make it listen in monitor mode. So this WLAN zero is actually flipped back here, this network adapter right here. And so I have to bring it down here, which is essentially turning it off. And then I bring it up into monitor mode and then I restart it. I, I run a command that shows me now that that network adapter is in monitor mode and now I can passively eavesdrop on those connections. And so now notice that I'm listening to all of the wireless devices in the vicinity and there's quite a few of them in here. Notice that we have these over the, here, the S E S S I D. So there's bad medicine, bad medicine guest, uh, bright house networks, AT and T and so on. It's listening to all the E S S I D's, which is essentially all of the Wi-Fi access points in the area. And if we go down here, we find out that here's one called UA lab, which is the name of the access point, which as I described in the second video is then is that the drone is actually its own access point, Wi-Fi access point. And that's its name right there. Notice that in the ENC column, that's showing the type of encryption used and notice that all of them have WPA2 except the drone. And we go over here, and notice that we can find the MAC address of the drone right here. And now we have enough information to actually perform that attack. And so again, as I said, that the drone is a borrowed drone, so I'm not going to be flying it and then knock it off because I don't know what's going to happen to the drone. So now it's sitting in my office. And so this is the interface to the AR Drone 2 app. And you can tell that it's got a, quite a bit of information. Notice that it has the battery information. Notice here that it has a Wi-Fi connection strength. It shows that it's on record right here. If you want to take a photo, you would click this icon here. Down at the bottom, here's uh, the icon for takeoff. Notice on the left-hand side, it shows that it's at zero meters. This is the altitude. On the right-hand side, it's zero kilometers an hour. Because it's just sitting, on the floor of my office and it's recording as you can see and now I run the command that we saw before the air replay command and now it's sending a single a sending a series of packets actually I only need to send one in this case but it says it's waiting for this beacon frame and it's sending a packet that essentially says hang up the connection it essentially it says hang up this connection and the next thing you know, it says control link not available, which means now there's no connection between the controller and the drone. And now we've got this. So that worked. Something else we could do. Well, we know that most drones now contain some sort of camera. And so would it be possible to steal the video feed that is listening on the video that's going from the drone to the controller? Let's see if we can do that. So again, we've kept the external network adapter in monitor mode. And now we're going to use a very old command from Linux called TCP dump. And the only thing TCP dump does is to listen for network packets. But we're going to make it very specific because we don't right now want to, to capture all the network packets we only want to capture the video packets the top red rectangle shows the tcp dump command that says to listen to port 55555 which was the video feed and we only want to listen to the mac address source which is the drone so this should make it very specific to not only the drones packets but also only those from the video feed and you see up here, I collected very, you know, very quickly uh, 2,253 packets. And so I download these to my Macintosh and I bring these into the free open source protocol analyzer Wireshark. And it shows you here that I connected the correct port and packets. Notice that the source is dot one, which was the drone and the destination was dot two. And remember, I'm not even con I'm not even connected to the network. I'm listening to this through monitor nodes. So everything that I've captured here is eavesdropping. Also notice that over here in the info category that I only captured port 5555, which was the video 
import feed. Now, if you look at this in the raw mode, this is what we get. And of course, um, video, as you probably know, is not going to be in a human readable format. It's in a proprietary format. It's something that's not meant to be read by humans. It's meant to be analyzed and to be viewed using some sort of app or application or program. If we looked at that upper left hand corner, we saw that it said P-A-V-E. That's pretty much all that we could read in there. And so PAVE is actually a video is actually a wrapper for video frame and that PAVE stands for Parrot Video Encapsulation. As it turns out the AR drone transmits H. 264 video to the controller on port 55, 5555 5, 5, rather, and it's encapsulated with this PAVE wrapper. That's not a lot of fun because we need a, a PAVE unwrapper. All we've done is we've stolen the video and we've got it in the file, and then we would have to actually unwrap that, and then we'd be able to play it in a video player. But what I want to be able to do is to be able to do this in real time. That is to see what the drone is doing while it's flying. So what I want to do is to be able to do that in real time so that as the drone is flying, I'm seeing the video that it's capturing and feeding back to the controller. And it turns out you can do that, but it's a little differently done than what we did with just capturing the video feed and saving it as a file. So there's a program called FFmpeg, which is a free and open source pro project that consists of libraries and programs for handling audio, video, and other multimedia files and streams. It can be used for lots of different things, by the way. And part of that program is something called FF Play, which is a program that can capture video. However, in this case, it requires a connection to the drone. So recall when we were looking at connecting to the drone via Telnet, this is the way this would work. So we would have to go back, get out of monitor mode, and then reconnect to the drone from our proxy. Now the downside of that, it cuts the video feed to the controller. So once you run that FF play on the proxy, the controller is no longer going to be able to see that feed. And so it would be obvious to the pilot in command that something was wrong. But if you do run FF play, once you connect to the drone, if you're listening in on port 555, you do, you are able to see in real time what the drone is seeing. And that's exactly what's happening right here. Now, actually, one of my students did this for me as part of some of his research, but you see up here in the upper left-hand corner, he's running FF Play, and notice that he's listening in to the drone off of this port, and notice that he's running this on his proxy, and that's what he's seeing. So he's, ab he's able to see in real time what the drone is seeing. Again, the downside of this is that the pilot in command loses his or her feed, so it would be obvious that something was wrong. Has this ever been done before? Well, it has. A few months ago, some video came out in the mainstream media that showed Chinese prisoners that were handcuffed and blindfolded. And I can't remember how long this video was. It's a very short video. It's about probably three to five minutes, but it was showing them, as you see here, sitting down and then they were being marched off somewhere. But if you look at the rest of this photo, this shows that this was in the upper left hand corner, a DJI drone, which is some of the better drones. And it's a Chinese company. It's a Chinese drone. And you see here, here's some Chinese characters in here, but a lot of the interface should show you that this is obviously a photo of a drone. Well, I can guarantee you that the Chinese government did not take this photo and then leak it. As it turns out, while this drone was flying, that somebody was able to hack into either the drone or the controller and to steal this video feed. Okay, so we've seen that we can capture the video feed, but what about all the other data that we've talked about? For example, the if you think about it, there's going to, the controller, to control the drone, you have to have commands running from that smartphone to the drone to tell it to what to do. To go left, to go right, to go up, to go down. Let's see if we can steal that data. Once again, we're running this TCP dump command. But notice one thing that's missing in here. We're not listening to the, we're not listening to a particular port. We're listening to everything, all the ports. We have to put that external adapter back into monitor mode in order to do this. 
And so notice here we captured 399 packets. And let's see what that traffic looked like. Interesting. Recall before when we only captured the video that we saw a bunch of binary code that we couldn't understand. Now we look at it and we see we're getting some things that we can actually read. Notice all the human readable text in here. Soft general motor too hard. General video enable. Control hovering range control and so on. Well it turns out these are configuration details and instructions to the drone that are being sent to and from the controller and the drone. If we look even further we see these things called AT commands which are instructions to control the drone's flight. And these occur, if you look down here in the bottom left hand corner, over port 5556. And if you look at these commands in here, they differ a little bit. AT, PCMD, MAG, uh, AT, REF, and so on. Well, what does this mean? Well, this shows you exactly what it means. And there's the references down here. The AT, REF is used for input. And that's for takeoff, landing, emergency, and stopping commands. The ATPCMD is for flagging, rolling, pitching, gazing, yawing. It's for moving the drone. So that's what all of these commands do. Now I want you to think about that for a second. Should we be able to read these commands in a human readable format? Since we can read these commands, it means that the channel is not encrypted, meaning that we could do a man in the middle attack or a woman in the middle of attack, a person in the middle of attack. That's something that we discussed in the second video, is that if you could place yourself in between the controller on the left and the drone on the right, you could intercept those commands, you could change those commands, and actually control the navigation of the drone. In these types of attacks, the man, person, woman in the middle is a very old attack. Okay, the next attack, let's disrupt, that is jam the signal from the controller to the drone. I want you to realize that a lot of these things that I'm doing here are essentially illegal. They are highly illegal. They're not illegal if I do it to myself for research purposes, but if I did this to some, somebody else, um, the full force of the law could come down on you, so you need to be very careful about all these things. And realize that a lot of things you do in your classes could potentially be illegal, you know, running a network scan or using a program to exploit a vulnerability in a computer. You're learning that because you want to be, let's say, a cybersecurity person or an IT systems administrator, so you need to understand how those things work. But if you're going to be doing those things in real life, you really have to understand you need to work within the limits of the law. So I'm going to jam the signal between the controller and the drone. I need to make sure that I don't affect any other signals around me when I'm doing that. That is, my neighbors on either side of my house. Now realize I sit on a pretty large area of land and my nearest neighbors to each side are anywhere from 50 to 100 yards away. It still doesn't matter. I want to be very careful when I do this. So how do I make sure when I do this jamming that I don't affect anybody else? Well, I'm going to be doing this within something called a Faraday cage. And a Faraday cage means that it limits this, these jamming signals only to the what is included within that cage. I had to create a Faraday cage for this experiment. And to do that, I had a large container, like three feet by two feet, and it was my dad's wooden Korean War Navy storage box I purchased some heavy-duty aluminum foil and whether you know it or not aluminum foil comes in different gauges and I got the, the thickest gauge that I could uh, which is like uber thick I'm not sure what you would use it for but it was much heavier than what you would usually buy at a, a store it also requires something called an RF radio frequency transceiver and a uh, transceiver means that it can not only receive RF signals, but can also send signals. I also needed a portable battery. I also needed my Raspberry Pi with an attack script. And then I had my, uh, now I'm using a different, a different drone in here. Um, not for any particular reason, but just because I wanted to change the drones. And as you recall, in one of the earlier videos, I discussed that when I did this research, that we actually used 
three different drones. And so the Parrot Bebop was a secondary drone that I used for this uh, particular experiment and also with an iPhone controller this time as opposed to an Android phone. Now this is showing my Raspberry Pi, which you've seen before, that it's in it sitting in its little case. And this is my Hack RF1 transceiver. And this is its antenna over here on the left. This is a $300 transceiver. It's very small and it's really not that powerful, but I'm just doing this as a proof of concept. In real life, if I were the military or an intelligence agency, I would not be using a $300 transceiver. You would have something much more powerful and expensive. So how did this work? Well, I had to connect the transceiver to my proxy right here, and you see it right here. The transceiver, the Hack RF-1. This is the Korean War uh, Navy box from my dad. Uh, it's, this is showing everything in here prior to using the aluminum foil to prevent a barrier. Notice in here that I've got a, actually in this case, I'm actually using a different external adapter network adapter and I uh, I covered this about five or six times the wooden box five or six times not only inside but also outside so this was a very very well protected box now here's everything that's sitting in the box and so here's the parrot bebop right here that's been turned on you see the blue back here here is the iPhone controller and you notice here on the uh, screen is actually taking the video which is showing the perspective from the drone here's the hack RF1 transceiver here is a portable battery pack and in the bottom right hand side is my proxy which is the Raspberry Pi this is a screenshot of what the parrot drone is seeing and notice that everything is working it's taking video notice that it's got a slightly different graphical user interface for the Parrot Bebop. And this is an example of what a jamming experiment looks like. And so this is just a separate thing that I did. So what you're seeing here is a radio frequency analyzer that's looking at the RF spectrum of 260 kilohertz right here. So there's RF noise from all different types of things around the environment. But what I wanted to show you is what it looks like is that once I turn that on, whoops, is that once I turn that on, this is what it looks like. So everything you see here is a signal. So notice that everything kind of, let me see if I can jump back and forth between here. And you see how now all that noise was added. This is a jamming signal. Everything in yellow is a jamming signal. And so back here we see this and I run that script and then the transceiver starts and it runs the jamming and now all of a sudden that it's no longer connected. Now you know what, in the grander schemes of things, this was not a big deal because this was not a realistic experiment. A realistic experiment would be one where I took the drone outside and then I would be able to see how that transceiver that I have and how my setup would affect the drone at let's say 10 feet, 50 feet, 10 yards, 50 yards, 100 yards. And of course, the one thing I can't do <laughs> is to do that outside not legally you know I would need special dispensation probably from the FCC I need to take it out in the desert somewhere I wasn't able to do that but the whole point was behind this is just to show one of the types of attacks that somebody could pull off and actually the military does this all the time every military in the world does electronic warfare and one of the things they do is signal jamming and this was just a small small experiment to show you how it's done but is it realistic in no way. Okay, let's look at the simplest attack possible. And we've kind of seen this before. Can you think about the simplest attack that we've discussed before? Recall that we had these destructive commands. We have the power off, the halt, and the reboot command, which essentially would turn off the drone. Let's see if we can do that. So notice here, I'm on the proxy and I'm connecting to the drone via Telnet. Connected the proxy. Notice that I'm on the drone now. And in the bottom left hand corner, I run the power off command. Connection closed by foreign host. And I was seeing this and then this. So essentially, I turned the drone off. Now, what did we learn from all this? 
So recall that I discussed in the second video that we use three drones to try to see how secure they were or how susceptible they were to cyber attacks. Use the Parrot AR Drone 2, the Parrot Bebop, and the Holly Stone Drone. For each of the drones, we found a number of things. The first thing is that multiple users can connect to the drone simultaneously because there was no means to limit the number of users to connect to the drone. Recall in the second video, I discussed that for the Bebop drone, we were able to connect 15 simultaneous users to the drone. We also showed that there was no authentication for the smartphone, that is, for a user to connect to the drone. There was no username or password required for any of the drones. For each of the drones, we found there were multiple open ports, that is, multiple open services. There was no authentication for FTP or Telnet, and there was no encryption for services by default. However, having said that, is that for two of the drones, the Bebop and the Holly Stone, you could turn on encryption. However, it's kind of silly not to do that by default. And I don't know why you would ever not want encryption to be used, because that's just going to open up potential cyber vulnerability issues. Uh, as it turns out that all three drones were susceptible to deauthentication attack. All use the Wi-Fi protocol to connect the controller to the drone and because of that we could use that aircrack ng software to create an a deauthentication attack but there's really nothing actually you could do about that you would just have to hope that there were no bad actors in the vicinity uh, in order to perform that type of attack we saw that for the parrot ar and for the other drones we could intercept the commands and the video feeds and the reason we could do that is because the communications channels were not encrypted and of course and this goes without saying this is actually absolutely no big deal is that all three were susceptible to jamming anything that runs on any radio frequency spectrum channel is going to be susceptible to jamming we saw for the parrot ar drone we can download and upload files uh, for two drones, we could connect via Telnet to turn off the drone, and those were the AR Drone 2 and the Holly Stone drone. And the bottom line of all this, as you see, is that almost everything that was done in this research, and this was just research involving one of the drones, really, is that everything we've done is the same type of tasks, the same activities that a system administrator would do to try to see if any of their computing systems, you know, your laptops, your desktops, anything that was connected to a network, whether to see whether they were vulnerable or not. So essentially, as we discussed in the very first video, that drones are flying computers and all computers are susceptible to attacks. The creation of this video was funded by a National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Grant from the National Cyber Center Training and Education Center out of Whatcom Community College.